And you can open your Bible to the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 8 and verse 9 this morning, chapter 8 and verse 4 rather, I'm sorry, chapter 8 and verse 4. It's important to remember every time we read the Bible, we are handling divine power. We might think of those men that, that handle highly explosive material, material of incredible potential for damage. In this case, we're handling something with incredible potential for transformation, for conviction, for life-altering momentum. And especially when we have been in the church any length of time, we've been listening to sermons any length of time, it, it, it is easy, very easy, to slip into a, a sort of commonplace view of a sort of a breakfast view of Bible reading where we, we hear the word and it's something we should do, it's good to do, we, and we, we lose a little bit of the wonder, the kind of spirit-filled moment that the preaching and proclamation that God's word is. And we, we want to try to get our hearts in a place where that is our anticipation. Even as we read the scriptures, we are reading the breathed out words of God himself. So let's have that anticipation as we read this passage beginning in verse 4 of chapter 8. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, crying with a loud voice, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him, because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip... As he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages, of the Samaritans. I was remembering in preparing to examine this passage this morning a, a, an image, a video image of a, a tidal wave a couple of years ago. It was after, I think it was after that tidal wave that had overtaken um, Japan uh, portion there and there was just a video of, of the water just, just flowing uh, inland and over streets and past buildings and so forth and, and the incredible 
power and force of this water and how, how um, strange it looked to see this a gigantic amount of water just flowing past barriers and streets and buildings and just a flowing down over the city. And I, I know in, in that case, it's just this incredibly destructive and devastating kind of event. But in the gospel, there is a similar kind of power except to destroy evil and promote good, to accomplish something uh, beautiful and glorious and to destroy something terrible and destructive. But the same kind of power could be used to describe the gospel. And that's a little bit what we're seeing here. The gospel is expanding. It's spreading. As though this great tidal wave is now spreading out and the initial wave has crashed and now it's just the water moving inland, creeping and, and advancing. And, and no amount of, of barriers or, or buildings or obstacles or landmarks or objects of previous esteem can, can resist or stop the flow of this gospel wave that is rolling forward and now in this passage for the first time, rolling out of of Jerusalem. It's just rolling forward. And I, I was remembering that image and I thought that's what's happening here. That's what Luke wants us to get. The gospel and the power behind it is spreading. There is no limit to it. There's nothing that can stop it, nothing that can resist it. It's just flowing past structures and statures and barriers that in any other time would have seemed firm and stable and exalted and powerful. Now, now they're, they're just <laughs> They're just part of the landscape as the, the water of the gospel is flowing outside into the community. I think that's Luke's point in this passage. There is no limit to the power of God in the spread of the gospel. And the accent on power, I think, is brought out in this passage in a unique way. It's, it's present throughout Acts, but there is a, a sort of a power competition or contrast accented in this passage. I want to I look at this, this power focus on the expansion of the gospel in four sections. First of all, there's a divine expansion. Divine expansion we see in verse 4 through verse 8. Now, you remember the context of this. Stephen, the uh, mercy ministry worker of the church of Jerusalem, has been also preaching the gospel, and the religious leaders were outraged at him. They, they took him outside the city. They stoned him. And Saul, who will come up later in the book, is there approving of his execution. So this is the first martyrdom. And like that is the case throughout Acts, this martyrdom has the opposite uh, result of the intention. What it says in verse 4, we referenced last week, is that instead of crushing the gospel spread, it only serves to expand it. Those, it says, who were scattered, now they were scattered by persecution, what do they do? They go about preaching the word. So instead of destroying the gospel expansion, it actually accelerates it. And then Luke drops into a specific example, a very important theological example in verse 5. The gospel is expanding. Here's an example. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And he goes on to do signs as the apostles did. Even unclean spirits come out of many crying with a loud voice. And the paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was much joy in the city. So there's this rejoicing expansion. And the clear understanding is God is on the move. God is on the move. Irresistible. Unstoppable. And it's important for us to appreciate the overwhelming moment this is because of where Philip is preaching. Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. They were ethnically uh, impure, you might say, from a Jewish perspective. They were not pure-blooded Jews. They had abandoned even the prophets, and they only believed in the first five books of the Bible, the Law of Moses. They worshipped on Mount Gerizim rather than on Jerusalem. They were anticipating a different kind of Messiah. I mean, th these were the original syncretists of the Jewish religion. They were trying to blend their own perspective into the historic teaching of the Jewish faith. The Jews did didn't like them. There was a racial, ethnic, cultural, religious divide around Samaria. 
If you remember the story of your Bible, Samaritans were basically the leftovers of the ten tribes of Israel, which had been exiled early when the Assyrians came, and then some of them were able to come back, but they intermarried and so forth. And so this was this was basically a result of Israel's sin that there's these people here, and as opposed to the tribes of of Judah and 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 those that had followed David, and they had kind of remained pure religiously, we might say it that way. And so the, the Jewish people, the descendants of the tribe of Judah and others that had been with David, they, they were the, the true, we might say, Israelites, and the Samaritans were despised. They didn't believe the right Bible. They didn't know the right stories. They didn't worship at the right place. They were less than, other than, not to be treated with. So when Philip, this mercy ministry worker who serves the widows in Jerusalem, is scattered because his buddy Stephen just got murdered in Jerusalem. The fact that his thought is to go to Samaria can only be traced to Jesus' promise in chapter 1 that they would preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. There's no cultural explanation for this. This doesn't make any sense from a conservative Jewish standpoint. This only could be explained by his belief that God is propelling his gospel past geographic boundaries, ethnic boundaries, cultural boundaries, historical boundaries, and Jesus said the gospel is going to go to Samaria. I'm going there and I'm going to preach. I saw my brother Stephen die with full of faith in the Lord, trusting in Jesus. Well, if that's the case, then I can go to Samaria no matter what happens. And he goes, and God himself attends his preaching with incredible power. The Samaritans, it says, pay attention to what Philip is saying, and he's given power to cast out even unclean spirits. There is demonic possession taking place in this Samaritan town, and the unclean spirits are powerless to resist the power of God resident in Philip as he casts them out in verse 7. And even those who are paralyzed and lame are suddenly able to move. You want to notice the movement that happens in verse 4 through 8. There's a lot of movement. Philip goes down to Samaria, and then he preaches, and these signs happen. The demons are cast out of people. Those who are immobilized are suddenly able to move, and there is much joy in the city. There's a sense of movement throughout the, the description of the narrative. The idea is God's power is on the move, authenticating and, and credentialing his gospel. And even demonic bastions of power are being overthrown. They can't resist the flowing forward of this gospel. The gospel is expanding. Expansion is taking place, even into Samaria. Very, very important. So what this means is Jesus will be the Messiah, not just for true-blooded Jews who have followed the full Old Testament law, but even beyond that, for these Samaritans who do not have the full understanding of the Old Testament. Jesus is the king and the solution and the savior for them as well, and God's power is not limited to Jerusalem. It will expand beyond that. Divine expansion. It's worth for us to look at this and, and feel the effect of the divide with Samaritans and to ask the question, is there any group or type of person that we have trouble believing can receive the gospel? Is there any group or type of person that we have trouble believing can receive the gospel? Because Philip believes in the power of God behind the gospel so much that he journeys this difficult journey down to Samaria to preach the gospel in what surely would have been considered impossible ground. And difficult especially because it wasn't like they're just these Gentiles who have no idea about God and the gospel. These are people that are caught up in this kind of syncretistic, pluralistic view. They, they think they're right with God, but on the other hand, they only have half the story. And if you've ever talked to somebody who has only half the story, but they think they have the whole story, that's some of the hardest people to talk to. Because you're having to constantly say, well, no, that's not right, but that is. Very difficult to talk to somebody like that. Philip is undeterred. He goes right into the territory and starts preaching and God attends it with power and, and demons can't even resist him. They're cast out in Jesus' name. Is there any stronghold of evil that we believe is more powerful than God in the spread of his gospel? Go through the list of 
groups and types of people in your mind, a type of person that you might think, man, there's no way. There's no way they would ever respond. That's the kind of people Philip's preaching to. That's the kind of people that are paying attention to him with one accord and are amazed at the power of God displayed through him. Divine expansion. All right, section number two, divine conversion. Luke, as a good storyteller, he, he first tells what happened, and then he explains just how profound it was. He takes us back in time to explain the setting in Samaria focused on this man named Simon. Verse 9, there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city. And we don't want to think of magic the way we would in the modern era where we all know sitting in the room that this is a person who has no divine abilities and he's just doing sleight of hand and we're impressed. And wow, you're really good at those card tricks. No, no. This has in view a person who has been given some kind of demonic and evil ability to show some sort of sign to the people. He's been afforded a sort of a supernatural, a supernatural power. Actually, he himself says he's the power of God. You notice there in verse 10, they all pay attention to him. They all pay attention to him. So I'm captioning this divine conversion because this is what Luke's doing. He's saying there was a person before Philip came, there was a person in Samaria that people looked at as the instrument and representation of divine power. His name was Simon. And they all noticed this is the exact same language. So if you're reading this story on your own and you're trying to get what's the main point here, you want to notice that, that Luke intentionally uses the same language. They pay attention to Luke. Notice that in verse 6. They used to pay attention to Simon. You notice the same language there? They were amazed at at uh, Philip, now they used to be amazed at Simon. So you notice that the same language. There's a conversion happening here. What they used to think of Simon, they now think of God as preached by Philip. What they used to focus on in Simon, now they are focusing on as Philip proclaims the good news of the kingdom in Jesus. There's a conversion from one divinity so-called to another that's taking place here from one miracle worker so-called to another the counterfeit is being exposed by the true so that's why luke's doing in these stories saying look there's a there's a conversion taking place what they used to think was amazing they don't think is amazing anymore what they used to think was divine they don't think is divine anymore what they used to pay attention to they don't pay attention to anymore there's a conversion happening that's what they're saying here in verse 12, it says, when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And here's the ultimate conversion. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and wonders and great miracles. Notice the irony here. He was amazed. So the amazement charlatan is amazed. The magician is impressed. R remember the importance of irony in the book of Acts. When it says Simon was amazed, you're supposed to feel the irony of that. You're the guy that amazed everybody, and now you're amazed. What's happening here? Luke is saying that there is this counterfeit power. It can masquerade as divine power, and we have no reason to think that, that given the demonic influence there, I think it's likely that Simon was aided by some kind of demonic power to practice magic, in that sense, in the city. There are real demonic powers that can do real supernatural things on this earth. And if we've never experienced them, they are certainly present in the scriptures and certainly present around the world. Certainly, the Bible indicates that the prince of the power of the air is at work in the sons of disobedience, here to seduce by a display of power, here to manipulate by the cravings of this world, doing different things in different regions, different times. In Samaria, he had amazed and seduced the people through his servant Simon, but when the real power of the real God comes into play, this kind of power is shown to be a sham, and the crowds convert to believe in Philip and his Messiah, and even Simon himself acknowledged a greater power than he could wield. Divine conversion. What do we take from this? There is no human pretender and no evil influence that is more powerful than the power of the gospel. 
There is no human pretender and no evil influence that is more powerful than the power of the gospel. Even those who are serving Satan himself can be converted when the power of God demonstrates the reality of Jesus Christ. There is no Satanist on this earth that can't be converted by the power of God in the gospel. There is no false teacher of satanistic lies and no worker of demonic miracles that can't be converted by the power of God in the gospel. And if that's the case for the leaders of those who are the servants of evil, then certainly it's the case for those that are seduced by them. There is no amount of evil in this world that when God determines to display his power, that evil can be converted and an acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord take place. False preachers and those preaching worldliness or even those trying to entertain humanity away from belief in the one true God are useless and pointless when it comes to resisting the spread of the gospel and the power of God. The church needs to believe this. Church needs to lay claim to this truth. That's why Luke wrote this, because he's writing to people that are surrounded by paganism, just like we are. Paganism that seems impressive and powerful, and people of incredible influence that seem to have some kind of supernatural power that is endorsing them and lifting them up and enabling them. And in our modern post-enlightenment society, we don't do this in the kind of the supernatural way, but doesn't it still feel the same? Don't you look out at the world and think, man, how, as, as a parent, for example, how, how can I show my children that, that this figure that is so exalted in the world and all of his evil and his debauchery is, more, is, is less exciting and worthwhile than Jesus Christ? How, how, I, can't, I can't be more impressive. I can't show my children something more impressive than, than this rock star or this movie star that exalts in evil or, or this trend in society that, that seems to, to, to seduce everyone that comes into contact with it. I, I can't do that. And Luke says, yes, you can, not because you have the ability, but because even Simon himself had to acknowledge that God himself was greater and that he was nothing in comparison to the preaching of this Jesus who is the Messiah. Parents, what do we have that is better than the stars of this culture, the demigods of music and media, those who have an almost religious sway over the minds of the young? We have the one message that God in his power is behind. And God is able to transfer attention even from a man like Simon to Jesus Christ. And he can do that today. Divine conversion. Third section, divine authentication. Luke picks up the Story back in the present. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now this, this paragraph is, is very important, but potentially confusing. It raises a theological question. Why didn't these apparently genuine uh, Samaritan believers receive the Holy Spirit since Peter said to those in Acts, if you repent and believe, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why this delay? Now this has been explained a lot of different ways and nuance, but one significant way that's been explained is this delay is essentially teaching a a different theological category than conversion. And if you were raised, as I was, in, say, a charismatic background or Pentecostal background or something along those lines, you might have heard that before. Well, like it happened in Samaria, that's how it happens for every Christian. You believe in Jesus, and then at some point, either right then or at a later date or something, you have a separate experience, which is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, like it did in Samaria. So Luke is writing this so that the believers around the world and through all the ages would have that expectation. You believe in Jesus, and then you ask for the spirit to come upon you and it may be the case that he doesn't for a while because they're two separate experiences so that's how this has been explained and you can see where that idea would come from and some of you might might that might be your perspective i understand that 
This is one of those categories where I, I understand how Christians could have a different view of this. Okay, so let me just say that up front. I, I understand how Christians could say, yeah, it, it, you believe, but then you also have to pray for a unique and initial baptism of the Spirit like the believers in Samaria did. That's what happened to them, should happen to you. I understand how someone could believe that. I am not convinced that that is the best interpretation of this passage and the rest of the New Testament. So let me present how, how I think this is understood. For a couple of reasons. First of all, you notice in the description, it says the Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. So it doesn't seem to be saying that though they were indwelt by the Spirit and regenerated, it was as though they were awaiting a, a second experience. It seems to be saying that there's something that hadn't happened at all that normally should happen. That seems to be my reading of it. It's, it's not as though he's saying, yeah, like, like normal, you had to then pray for a second, second experience. The passage itself seems to indicate a degree of, of unusualness about this. The, the apostles seem to notice they, they had not received the Holy Spirit. That seems to have been their normal expectation. That'd be how I would read this. It didn't seem like the apostles said, yes, and as is normal, they had not received the Holy Spirit. We don't see that happening, for example, in Acts chapter 2. So this seemed more unusual, a unique case, we might say. Another and more important reason is I don't see any evidence in the explicitly clear teaching of the rest of the New Testament for this secondary theological category. Uh, there just isn't other evidence for this. If you read Paul, for example, or the other New Testament writers, their indications are that when you believe in Jesus, you receive immediately the new covenant blessing, the availability of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, you might have moments that you're, you're filled with the Spirit in a fresh way. They might happen repeatedly in your life. You might even have a significant moment after conversion where God meets you in a profound way. Certainly, that might happen again and again. Definitely, that could happen. But it doesn't seem as though, when you read Paul, that there's this distinctive theological category that every believer should think of and hope for and wait for. That doesn't seem to be the case. Paul seems to think that when you're converted, you immediately receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That seems to be Paul's expectation, these explicitly clear passages in the epistles. It's, it's worth, worth noting that. So if that's the case, how do we reconcile those two? How do we reconcile that Paul says believers are those who are in the Spirit? All who call on Jesus Christ receive the Spirit would be Paul's summation of it in his epistles. But the Samaritans didn't right away. Well, I think the best explanation is that because the expansion of the gospel to Samaria was such a groundbreaking, overwhelming, and absolutely unique moment in salvation history, there was this unusual delay so that the Holy Spirit could be, in a sense, authenticated. The conversion of the Samaritans could be authenticated by the commissioned witnesses of Jesus, Peter and John, as representatives of the apostles. And this delay would have the effect of this dramatic entrance into the believing community. You might think of it like a, a musical moment where there's this moment of silence and there's the drum roll and it builds. And then here comes the climactic crash and the music resounds. That's essentially what's happening here. God essentially is saying... Are they in? Yes. Are even the Samaritans included in the presence of God? Yes. There's this sense of dramatic narrative emphasis. Yes, the Samaritans, even the Samaritans are authenticated as the genuine people of God. That, I think, is the most natural reading and, and, and best reconciliation of this passage with other sections in the New Testament. Let me read a couple commentators who say this same thing. John Stott. The most natural explanation of the delayed gift of the Spirit is that this was the first occasion on which the gospel had been proclaimed not only outside Jerusalem, but inside Samaria. This is clearly the importance of the occasion in Luke's unfolding story since the Samaritans were a kind of halfway house between Jews and Gentiles. Or we might listen to David Peterson. He says this, The best explanation is that God himself withheld the Spirit until the coming of Peter and John in order that the Samaritans might be seen to be fully incorporated into the community of Jerusalem Christians who had received the Spirit at Pentecost. God withheld the gift for his own revelatory and salvific purpose. Now, important, where I would 
disagree with those who say that's the way it should always be is that there, there is no other occasion like the expansion of the gospel to Samaria and the Gentiles. There's no further rings. Once it goes to the Gentiles, everybody else is included. There, there's no further kind of epochs of gospel expansion. This is a gospel epoch. This is a gospel expanding moment, unique in salvation history. The fact that Samaritans can believe in Jesus is making a statement that only has to be made one more time when the Gentiles can believe in Jesus and they receive the Spirit. Once that happens, there are no groups, if a Jewish standpoint, no groups could possibly be excluded. If the Samaritans and the Gentiles can fully receive the Holy Spirit, well then there, there are no exceptions anymore. Exceptions have been obliterated. Everybody gets to be authenticated by the Holy Spirit. Everyone receives the gift of God. Everyone can claim Jesus as the Messiah. There, there are no exceptions. No groups can count themselves out of this invitation. Thus the dramatic drum roll, and then Peter prays for them, and the surprise, even Samaritans. You see, there's almost a beauty of the story when you read it that way, I think. There's almost a beauty of God saying, yes, it is open to all. Welcome in, brother Samaritan, and receive the full blessing of the Holy Spirit just as we have. Divine authentication. One application on this point. The gospel can reach those who only know half the story. I found that to be very encouraging. I was thinking about that this week. I thought, man, that's, that's true for a lot of people where we live. Isn't that true for people where we live? Where they kind of know like half the story, like a Samaritan. They're not like full-on pagans, all of them, who like, you know, actually think Zeus is real and, you know, actually wonder if Wonder Woman is actually going to, you know, maybe she is out there somewhere. Now, we don't tend to have those kind of people. I mean, mostly, you see them occasionally in the theaters, but, but not always, not always. Usually, it's these kind of halfway folks. It's like, oh, you know, God, I'm a God-fearer. I know about Jesus. I know a few Bible stories, but their understanding is, is kind of halfway, and it's mixed, and they have, yeah, I think Hindus have something on it, too, and I really like Jesus, but I also really like Buddha, and you're just like, whoa, you just got like half the story, man. Pick and choose some Bible stories that you like. Ignore the ones you don't. I mean, doesn't that sound like a lot of people in our area right here? I think it does. And this story encourages me because that's the way the Samaritans were. They, they could quote Genesis, but they didn't know anything about Isaiah. And you might think of the person who could quote, Jesus said, love your neighbors, but has no idea what Jesus said about heaven and hell. And Philip sees with his own eyes and John and, and Peter witness with their own eyes God pouring out his spirit on people like that so they come to full faith and receive the full outpouring of the spirit. That is good news for us, brothers and sisters. When you're talking to your, your neighbor that went to Baptist school as a kid but hasn't gone to church in years and, and seems to have half the story and, and some part grace, some part work, some part go to church on Easter and that's how you get to heaven, how do you talk to a person like that? Well, that's like a Samaritan and God moved and showed them the reality of Jesus as the Messiah. It's good news. It's good news when you think about your parents who have a kind of a God-fearing, honor God, do your best, and I'm sure Jesus will take care of the rest view of theology. That's like a Samaritan, and God moved in Samaria in power and revival. It's good news. It's good news for your child who has a part of the story, and somehow they missed the other part. They have the part that God's able to save people, missed the part about how you repent and believe in him. But, but God's able to save people who have a kind of a halfway understanding of God. It's good news for us. That's why Luke wrote this story to encourage other believers that would encounter people like this. And ultimately, for God to show, see, see, what Jesus said would happen is happening. It expanded past the borders of Jerusalem and even into Samaria. Divine authentication. Finally, divine confrontation. Divine confrontation. Simon, it is revealed, had at least an extremely immature understanding of salvation and at worst, a spurious profession of faith. Now, I read commentators who disagree about which it was and I'm not going to say which one is right because the passage doesn't and I don't know. Was Simon just 
extremely immature? Did he ultimately repent when Peter told him to? Or was it a spurious profession of faith? I don't know. The gospel sometimes, and, and Acts as well, can describe those who believed as those who genuinely believed and those who just professed to believe. And it just, in some ways, it's helpful because that's true for our experience as well. You can't always tell the difference. And you can't really tell the difference in Simon here. But clearly, minimally, Simon is extremely immature in his understanding and continues to be greedy for power and influence because he goes to them in verse 19 and he offers money saying, give me this power also so that anyone whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter immediately rebukes him. This introduces a different kind of limitation, but this passage is still all about power and control and influence. Can Samaria limit the power of God? No. Can demons limit the power of God? No. Can previous evil charlatans limit the power of God? No. What about people looking to attain human power through the spread of the gospel? Can they control the power of God? Peter says, no. It's all about limits and power. Simon wants to have his own control over the Holy Spirit. He assumes that just like the way the demons work, they'll let me control them to accomplish their ends. So clearly, if I pay you enough, everyone has a price, Peter and John. Let me pay you enough, and you can give me the Holy Spirit power. Now, Peter, aside from it being impossible, also sees it as evil, he says, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. In other words, this has nothing to do with you for your heart is not right before God. And then he appeals to him again, repent therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. So once again, we have Peter, good instruction for us as nice people. Christian Americans who like to be nice all the time, Peter calls this guy out on the spot. He calls him out. This kind of arrogance and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, against God himself, the claim that he could be controlled by money, it needs an immediate rebuke. Now, it's not a self-righteous rebuke. He offers, if you repent, and, and God may forgive you of this, but you must immediately repent of this. This desire to control God, to use God for your own ends, it is wickedness. And you must repent immediately, Simon. And you should have no assurance that you are included in this, in this uh, journey, in this, this mission that we are about. You have no part or lot, he says. You are caught up in the gall of bitterness, in the bond of iniquity. He's basically saying, Simon, you are imprisoned. If you want to know who's, who's under control, you're under the control of sin right now, Simon. You can't control God. Sin is controlling you, Simon. You must repent of this. You must not dare to believe that you can control God. It's one of the most abrupt and scathing rebukes in the book of Acts. Scathing towards this man who had professed faith and even had been baptized. Just a quick side note for the church. There are moments when extreme expressions of sin, even among professed believers, must be directly and profoundly rebuked. I, I, I am grateful that in the heritage of churches that I grew up with and Sovereign Grace churches, um, all the pastoral examples that I grew up with were gentle and kind and gracious men who were loving and would have been fine to have you over at their house, right? I mean, they were, I, I'm grateful for that. I benefited from that and in my own way, try to reflect that, model that as best as I can. However, the one danger is that in moments where profound rebuke is needed, it can sometimes be shocking to people. It can catch them off guard. I heard, I heard somebody say one time, a pastor needs different voices. Some for calling the sheep, some for correcting wolves. <laughs> you need different voices. And this is a moment just to point out that this kind of voice is present in the scriptures. 
And Aaron and I and, and Bart, when he come back, it's, it's not a voice that we'd want to use on a regular basis and certainly never except in the extremity of sin. But it is a voice that is present and needed in the church at times. Now, I think often in history, pastors and leaders wasted this voice on generally repentant and generally godly people. As You walk in no matter what you're doing, you're just going to get the whatever scared out of you on a Sunday morning. But in moments where sin and this kind of wickedness is just being embraced, the assumption that you can defy God without consequence, a pastor or even people in the church need to say, you must repent. If you do not repent, you have no confidence except to be destroyed. There is no end to this journey but death. And you need to know that that's an important voice for a pastor, for a leader, even for a fellow Christian to have prepared for this kind of a moment. So kind of an aside, but that's what Peter says to Simon in an attempt to rescue him. Simon, if you keep thinking you can control God, you will perish with your money. Now, we don't know what happens to Simon. And if you want my personal opinion, I think in the same way that the book of Jonah ends without knowing what happens to Jonah, Luke ends the story of Simon without telling what happens to Simon. Because ultimately, he's not primarily concerned about Simon. He's concerned about his readers. And he wants them to know no person can manipulate the gospel for money. And no person better dare attempt it. I think it's a word of rebuke for anybody even today who would attempt to manipulate the gospel of God to gain a standing, a crowd. It is a firm rebuke to anyone that would even venture in that direction. Peter's rebuke should resound loudly in the ears of anyone who would assume that gospel or the Holy Spirit or the power of God can be manipulated for the sake of personal gain and stature. Don't you dare, Peter would say. It's worth being sobered by the rebuke to Simon and to consider seriously, I don't know what happened to Simon, but I know what can happen to me as long as I repent and believe so that I can be forgiven of anything in my heart that would seek to control or manipulate God. Any person should take that rebuke firmly in hand. Divine confrontation. You also want to notice the contrast. Simon is left in this ambiguous place. We don't know what's going to happen to Simon. We hope he repented. We hope he turned. We hope that that prayer was effective and that he prayed for himself as well. But what we do know, what we do know, notice the contrast in verse 25, is the gospel. This confrontation ends with Simon on an ambiguous question about the future of his life. But the gospel, there is no ambiguity. Verse 25, now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So again, notice the contrast. Simon is left, hopefully quivering under this rebuke, but the gospel is expanding and spreading, not only in this town, but in many villages of the Samaritans. So we, we want to get used to how Luke writes and the way he makes his point. And often he makes it by irony and contrast. Simon is left trembling under rebuke, but the gospel is expanding. This man who thought he could control God is now under the control of rebuke by Peter, but the gospel is going forward. You notice the contrast and that makes the point. The gospel is not limited by anything because the power of God is behind it. There is no limit or control on the power of God, not human manipulation, not demonic possession, not human statures and structures. Nothing can limit the spread of the gospel. And this is the, the message and the point that's supposed to inspire us. Dare to believe in the limitless power of the gospel. Dare to believe it. Don't dare to assume you can control it, but dare to believe it. And Redemption Hill, let me, let me encourage us, dare to believe in the limitless power of the gospel. Put in your mind right now family members who have rejected Jesus for decades. Dare to believe that the power of God is behind the gospel and there is hope that they can be rescued. Dare to believe that sections of society that are so removed from gospel influence can believe and, and be transformed and converted in the way these folks were converted from Simon to Jesus. 
Dare to believe it. Dare to believe that your children who are currently hard-hearted can become soft-hearted. Dare to believe that your friend who has been running from God can turn around and run to God. Dare to believe that your co-worker who talks loudly against conservative belief in Jesus can be converted and turn to Jesus as the Messiah. Dare to believe it. Dare to believe it because that's the point of this passage. There is no limit to the tidal wave power of God and the spread of his gospel. There is no limit. It causes us to want to be used for it, to believe in it, to trust in it, to hope for it, even in the most hopeless circumstances, in the most powerful evil that we could witness. We can look at that and say, the gospel has overcome that before and it can overcome it again. It's good news for us. It's good news when we think about evil religions spreading in the world, seductive religions spreading in the states, paganism increasing, atheism increasing. It's good news when we think about school curriculums that deny God. It's good news when we think about cultural icons that promote evil and reject Jesus. It's good news when we think about all of those things because this passage says there is no limit. These were real people. Simon was a real figure. And in a moment, they were turned from him to Jesus. Let's think with gospel-sized categories about the people in our life. Think with gospel-sized faith. There is no limit to the power of God in the spread of his gospel dare to believe it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in the exaltation of your glory as revealed in this story, Lord, that you turn those now brothers and sisters of ours, Lord, from darkness to light. You turn them from demons to you. Lord, we are, thank you for that, Lord. You turn them from a charlatan to you as the Christ. Lord, we pray for those in our family, in our communities, Lord, our friends, our neighbors, co-workers, Lord, who are currently under the influence of the evil one, and we pray you would turn them from darkness to light. Lord, even as the prophetic word came earlier, we, we believe that you were able to deliver today, men and women, from the dominion of darkness to the dominion of light the dominion, the kingdom of the beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you, Lord. Do that among us. Do that through us. In Jesus' name, amen.